A very good morning to one and all. Uh, thank you so much for deciding to spend your uh, Saturday morning with us to learn more about Singapore's biodiversity. I am uh, Jayashree from the National Biodiversity Center and I would like to welcome you all into this session for those of you joining via Zoom as well as YouTube today. Today, we launched the 10th edition of the Festival of Biodiversity. This is NPARC's yearly celebration of our natural heritage organized in collaboration with the Biodiversity Roundtable. We will be having various activities online as well as on site at Singapore Botanic Gardens. We have got biodiversity talks, arts and craft activities, and a lot more. Something for everyone in your family to enjoy. So do visit the website, uh, Festival of Biodiversity, or if you're around the area in Singapore Botanic Gardens, please drop by to see the exhibits and learn more about what we have in Singapore. Here is an overview of today's session. So we have speakers from uh, the School of the Arts Singapore who will be sharing their journey with us. If you have any questions at any point of time during the session, and you are in uh, our Zoom audience, please do send in your questions as a private message uh, to host myself, Jayashree, and then we will try to address as much as possible uh, during uh, the end of the session at the Q&A section. I would like to introduce uh, today's speakers to you all. Uh, as I mentioned, they are students from the School of the Arts Singapore, and they will be sharing their journey on how they started to learn and appreciate Singapore's biodiversity through their lenses. Of course, you will be seeing some great photographs today and also learning from how our speakers started as non-scientists and then over the course of their photographic journey acquired more knowledge and eventually actually became advocates of Singapore's biodiversity uh, and conservation and dispelling misconceptions about what we have here. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to uh, hand it over to Luke Ang, Kevin Huang and Achit Sharma, our speakers. Over to the speakers now. Um, hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin, and welcome to the photographic journey or journal of three ordinary JC1 students. So during this talk, you will see many exotic or even alien looking creatures, which many of you would have never expected to find in Singapore. And by doing so, we hope to present the biodiversity in Singapore in a new light. Do you think that Singapore is a concrete jungle? There seems to be this perception that the biodiversity is in Singapore is extremely sparse with only your common Java miners and pigeons inhibiting, inhabiting the HDB block void decks. Whenever I show images of these creatures to the people around me, like my relatives, strangers, teachers, and even my barber, they are all extremely surprised and ask whether I see them in the zoo. To be honest, if you had asked me a few years ago, I would have also asked the same questions. After all, I had never really visited the nature reserves in Singapore and simply thought of Singapore as a concrete jungle with modern and high-rise infrastructure. In reality, there are plenty of secluded and natural spaces to take a break from the hustle and bustle of the city. It might come as a surprise, but according to the Netflix documentary Night on Earth, Singapore is one of the most wildlife-friendly cities in the world. Wildlife in Singapore is extremely intriguing, as despite being such a small and built-up nation, you are actually home to an extremely diverse ecosystem. Yet, this interaction between humans and nature has resulted in irrational fears and mistreatment of the biodiversity that we see today. From my own personal experience, whenever I go on like Instagram or like social media, I always see my friends posting fearfully about insects or maybe like uh, geckos in their homes. But in reality, most of them are actually completely harmless. And when you take a close-up view of them, you will often notice something magical and observe interesting behavior. 
However, something more consequential is when large Instagram pages like Mothership post hum wildlife human conflicts. An example on the slide, as you can see, will be one video of a wild boar, for lack of a better word, harassing a lady with a bike at Czech Java. At first, this paints wild boars in an extremely negative light when we don't understand the context behind the situation. In this scenario, the lady actually stored food in the basket of its bicycle. And naturally, the wild boar would, uh, the, naturally the wild boar would, would have been very inquisitive and wanted to eat the food within the basket. This shows how these disputes are formed as a result of people's lack of understanding in terms of the animal's behavior. In addition, we might also feel entitled to the space that we live in and feel that wildlife has encroached onto our urban space. But yet, they also have as much right to inhibit this environment. And thus, it is important to coexist with the flora and fauna of Singapore. So um, who are we? Uh, my name is Kevin and my other co-speakers cool Archer and Luke, and today we are giving you this presentation. Um, we are from SOTA, but do not be misguided as we do not actually have any experience in the visual arts. I myself, being a theatre student, have never really like touched or like got or, or really been experienced with photography. So I think the main point is that I want everybody to know that everybody can go into nature and appreciate uh, and appreciate the, wild, the wildlife there and take beautiful photographs, even if you don't have an artistic background. So how do we start? Like most um, young people, we are, we are always on like Instagram or like social media. And we came across many Instagram pages all over the globe. Uh, and we were fascinated by the details we saw in the photographs capturing wildlife from intricate patterns of feathers on birds or fascinating close-ups of insects. It instantly hooked us causing us to begin our journey. So how did we actually first start? Uh, our, first journey, our first shoot will actually be at the zoo and the bird parks. And we got started on this wildlife photography path when I first rented my, my telephoto lens. And I think even in the zoo, we understood very key and very, very, important, uh, very important lessons that we, we eventually took out, took with us when we went to capture the wildlife in Singapore. And that would be the importance of observation and understanding the behavior of the creatures we were documenting. For example, in this image, it shows the picture of a white tiger. And what I observed earlier was that the white tiger would often enter the water to cool down and lift its head out, popping its head out of the water. And because of that observation, I waited for the white tiger to actually enter the water and was able to capture this shot. However, it was not enough, and we realized that observing animals in the wild would be so much more rewarding. We wanted to observe the many different gems of nature, for example, prey and predator relationships, territorial conflicts, which is often not present within captive animals. Lastly, zoos and bird parks generally contain a pool of birds or animals across many different continents. But we wanted to focus more on our local wildlife and find rich biodiversity in its natural environment. So we first started with online resources and um, a very good site to start off with will be SG Biodiversity, where they actually post very high definition images of the creatures and even rank the creatures according to their taxonomic order. And so Luke, Archie and I will often send each other and send each other images of creatures that we wanted to see. For example, uh, the Singapore Blue Tarantula and you'll be wowed and amazed by them. And this eventually resulted in us creating like a little checklist of creatures that we wanted to see. But, you know, after a while of just looking at databases, we were really not satisfied and thus our new primary method of learning things is going out and actually observing such behavior. I'm not sure how to explain it, but being able to observe the behaviors that you see on documentaries in real life is, is another feeling and it's truly breathtaking. And at the same time, when you go out into the field, you actually chance across many knowledgeable experts, which will allow you to learn more about the flora and fauna in Singapore. So our first, uh, our first adventure into like, you, to explore the wildlife of Singapore will actually be Sungai Bulo. And we highly recommend this place for anyone who wants to start out because of the very rich biodiversity and unique biodiversity that you will not observe anywhere else. For example, we saw um, kingfishers, eagles, herons, egrets, and you can even find uh, co uh, cool animals like crocodiles and whip snakes. So we went during the June holidays and 
it was quite a boring day as we felt like as it was not during the migration period and we didn't really see many uh, many species that we wanted to ch- take off our checklist. However, we came as we were climbing one of the structures, we came across this majestic white-bellied sea eagle soaring overhead. And it was extremely close to us, allowing us to get this breathtaking sight of its astoundingly large wingspan. Another very important value would be the value of patience. I remember it was once again another quite a, a, a boring and dry day at Sumai Bruno and we didn't really see much after like five hours and we were going home feeling quite defeated. And suddenly we saw this group of people just crowding around this one little spot. And we were really confused and we, when, we, when we took a closer look, we realized that it was a king cobra. But after maybe five to ten minutes, everyone else in that little group decided that they had enough of just watching the snake move around and they left. But we, we, were, we were super intrigued because we were wondering why, why was the king cobra moving around in the same spot over and over again? And this patience eventually paid off because we noticed that the, the king cobra was actually hunting and it stuck its head into the crevice of a rock and pulled out a juvenile clouded, juvenile clouded water monitor lizard. And this was an extremely rare sight because king cobras only hunt every few months due to their slow metabolic rate. And thus to witness this hunting is special, rare and rare and requires lots of patience and not to mention luck. However, one word of warning is that the king cobra is actually the world's longest venomous snake with extremely potent neurotoxin. And because of, because of that prior knowledge that we already had, we obviously made sure to stand really far away from it with our long telephoto lenses and allowed and, and left the king cobra to, to devour its prey in peace. So after a year or so of photographing birds and reptiles, we soon realized that insects or even smaller organisms of Singapore are often underrepresented and unappreciated even by nature photographers. That intrigued us as we wanted to destigmatize the idea of creepy crawlies, resulting in our venture into deep beneath the undergrowth. Of course, moving from shooting clear skies and treetops to dense undergrowths in the dead of night posed its challenges. Firstly, there are no dynamic movements in macro photography like those used in tracking birds. For example, in this image, uh, this image actually shows that of a, of a cicada, a freshly molted cicada, uh, and it was positioned on a very strange position, uh, positioned on a very strange angle of the branch. And you see, the thing in macro photography is that you have to keep completely still to the point of regulating your breathing because any movement will actually cause your image to be unusable. And because of that, I actually had to go into some sort of limbo position and it's somebody else supporting my back. But luckily, after many attempts, I was able to document and give justice to the mesmerizing colors of this freshly molted cicada. Another important thing in macro photography is actually getting extremely up close to your subject. After all, if you want to capture the smallest details, you have to overcome whatever fear you might have of creepy crawlies. This was a way different experience from birding where we'll observe the birds from a distance of maybe 50 or even 100 meters. For example, this photograph was taken at five times magnification. And that essentially involves going maybe 0.1 centimeters to that of your subject. And, you know, I've heard many comments about how this insect looks like an alien. But in reality, it is simply, it is a common shape of beetle. And you won't believe the story of how we found it. You know, actually, I remember when I was in school, Luke called me and I was like, wow, I found this really cool beetle in school. And when I went up, when I went up and looked at the beetle, I, both of us realized that it was actually dead. And you know, the main point of the story is that you don't have to enter the deep undergrowth of the forest to find exotic or interesting looking species. All you have to do is keep your eyes peeled to your surroundings, be observant, and naturally you will observe nature's beauty. All right, so now I would like to pass the presentation on to my fellow speaker, Archit who will now share the nitty gritty details and, and give all of you a, a, a better idea and cool facts about the fauna that we have captured. Hi, uh, thanks for passing it over to me, Kevin. So we would now like to share the invaluable lessons that we have actually learned throughout our macro journey. Right off the bat, what you see above you is a picture of a cicada. Cicadas are actually quite interesting because they stay burrowed underground for a very long period of time, between two to 17 years. 
once they're ready to emerge, they latch onto a vertical surface like a tree trunk. Then their shell spits down the middle, cracking open before they wiggle away, wings extended. And this is exactly what you see in the picture. What I really like about this picture is that it depicts a story. The cicada is in the middle of its molting process and transitions into a new stage of its life. I feel like this is how macro photography has actually, been, has actually allowed us to peek into this new world and observe the circle of life of these tiny insects. Next, we would like to talk about the amazing disguises that nature actually has to offer to us. For example, mimicry. Mimicry is an evolved resemblance between an organism and another object. So a lot of insects that we have seen actually possess these capabilities uh, with patterns across their bodies meant to mimic a certain environment. We came across this incredibly interesting insect while exploring Thompson Nature Park. We initially thought that this was an ant given the structure of its body, but taking a closer look, we realized that this is not an ant. It's a spider. We can see this because the spider actually does not have compound eyes. I was very fascinated by observing this spider's behavior. It actually lived next to an ant colony, suggesting that it was probably trying to blend in with the ant colony and alter its behavior to make it look like an ant. I was also very fascinated uh, by, the, by, by observing this masked assassin bug, which is on the top left of the screen. While walking through the, the park, I was actually surprised to see a pile of dirt start to move beside me. I looked towards it and looking closer, I suddenly realized it's, a, it's an insect. It's a masked assassin bug. These insects are known to cover themselves with dirt as a camouflage. And that's why you usually don't see them hiding in plain sight. A very fun fact about this is that these insects are also known as the mochi bug here in Singapore due to their resemblance to the dish. This slide demonstrates one of the appeals of macro photography. It is so incredibly beautiful. Throughout our experiences during, doing macro photography, we've seen a kaleidoscope of color, texture, and shape. This is the magic of the insect world and wildlife in general. I would also like to talk about some of the preconceived notions that we had and how we uh, overcome, overcame these preconceived notions throughout our journey. So for example, what you see in this picture is the velvet ant. Velvet ants actually look like, they look like large hairy ants, but they're actually wasps. The males have two pairs of transparent black wings. However, the females don't even have wings. And that's why they're, they're confused with ants sometimes. When we saw this creature scuttling along the leaves, my immediate emotions were that of fear. Actually, this really popular YouTube uh, channel that I see is called uh, Brave Wilderness. This is where the, uh, the host of this YouTube channel actually goes around getting himself stung by uh, a variety of insects. So I was reminded that in one of his videos, he actually got stung by a velvet ant. And this is why as, as I approached this insect, I was actually quite scared. But contrary to our belief, as we observed its behavior, we actually realized that this is insect is a very gentle and beautiful animal. Our inherent assumption was that it would be aggressive but as is the case with most insects, we kept safe distance and it was completely fine. We were able to observe its beauty and its behavior as well. And this was a very fruitful experience. But the appeal of the animal kingdom is not just that it's aesthetically pleasing. Taking a close look at wildlife actually brings us to the frontiers of innovation. This is what we call biomimicry. It's the practice of adapting designs from nature for ourselves. So a prime example of this is the Kingfisher and the Japanese Shinkansen bullet train. When the bullet train was first created, it had a fatal design flaw. When it would enter tunnels, it would accumulate air at its nose. 
And as it left these tunnels, it would create large and loud sonic booms. The engineers looked to the beak of the common kingfisher, which is actually able to penetrate the water without causing disturbance on the surface. And adapting this design, they changed the nose of the bullet train and eliminated, completely eliminated the issue of this air buildup. How interesting is that? Another mind boggling instance that is actually surprisingly underrated and many of you will not know about is the biomimicry of the mantis shrimp. The mantis shrimp is among other things, well known for its eyesight. Its specialties are the ability to see something called polarized light. So inspired by the eyes of this mantis shrimp, scientists created a camera capable of seeing polarized light. And the mind blowing result of this is that they could actually detect cancerous cells that would otherwise have been hiding in plain sight. In other words, through the mantis shrimp, we progressed further in our ability to detect cancer early. So moving on, I'll now be talking, uh, and I'll be passing the presentation over to Luke, who will talk about our photography journey. Thanks, Ajit. I'll now be sharing on how we have grown as artists and some of the learning points that we have picked up along the way. Of course, it will only be half the story if we did not talk about the many people that we have met who helped us to grow as photographers. While photography is definitely a very technical skill, it is not just something that can be picked out of a textbook. Especially when dealing with life-sensitive subjects, it is invaluable to have a deep bank of personal experiences and knowledge to draw from. And when it comes to shooting out in the field, you never know when a new situation may suddenly get thrown at you. As such, nothing beats being able to learn from those who are more experienced than us. Over the past year or so, we have we have, been, we have learned important things from them, such as locations, time of day, and even which months to find certain subjects, as well as camera settings, gear recommendations, preparation, and species behavioral knowledge. I remember one time that we followed our friend Zestin to Thompson Nature Park after a sighting of a rare bee nesting was recorded there. He spent the morning waiting patiently at one spot without moving at all, and it really stuck with me. I think that it really taught us the value of persistence in this hobby. Another highlight of our nature journey was definitely when we met Dr. Andy Ang. Dr. Ang is one of the biggest voices for ecological conservation in the region, and she is the face of the effort to save our own critically endangered refuse banded langur from extinction. Prior to meeting her, I had read a lot of online scientific journals, journal articles that she had written or co-authored. When we talked to her, she was really friendly and down to earth and she even shared with us some of the behind-the-scenes work that goes into what she does. It was really quite inspiring as we were able to learn about how professional research scientists operate and conduct studies, and it reminded us of why we started this in the first place. Next, I would like to talk a little bit about our process of photographing wild creatures. When we first started, it was daunting because we had seen so many expert macro photographers that we didn't really know where to start, and setting foot into the forest at night was a new and exhilarating feeling. Everything that we saw felt really unexpected and exciting. Even finding some relatively common creatures like was, felt like a big moment. There was also some hesitation because there was that slight fear of what might be lurking behind a bush or under the next leaf. However, we very soon came to realize that the vast majority of so-called creepy crawlies are actually gentle and have no intention of hurting humans. Many of the creatures that we encountered actually have a very calm disposition, giving us ample time to photograph them from every angle. One example would be the beautiful jade huntsman spider that you see in this photo. Despite huntsman spiders usually having a very bad reputation for being menacing and aggressive home invaders, this particular individual stayed still on a fallen leaf for almost 30 minutes and allowed itself to be passed between us to be photographed. Finally, we returned it to the same place and position that we found it at, and we continued with our walk. Another memorable, another memorable story comes from earlier on in our journey, when we had just been doing macro photography for about a week. We were peering around some tall grass when a pretty large praying mantis actually voluntarily crawled up onto Kevin's hand. An interesting thing about praying mantises is that they are actually quite inquisitive and cute creatures, as they are sensitive to movement. When they detect movement using their big compound eyes, they immediately turn their head to look at it. 
In this case, he was really interested in us humans and spent quite some time looking curiously at us, allowing us to photograph it closely. You might be thinking, so then, I guess it's fine to handle the local wildlife. Well, as a general rule, I would still say not to. This is because different animals react differently, with some being friendly and harmless, while others could potentially pose a threat to your safety. Unless you can discern which is which, it is best to leave them alone and to observe from a safe distance. Moreover, when physically handling animals and their surroundings, there is a fairly high chance that you could cause damage or distress as the ecosystem is highly sensitive and you could never know the knock-on effects that one negligent action could potentially have. In forests with rich biodiversity such as Singapore's, just a few stray steps could trample an entire population of organisms. Another question you might have is, so with all these photos, I'm sure you guys have really expensive high-tech camera equipment, right? Well, these are the gear and equipment that we use when going on macro photography expeditions out in the field. However, there's good news. You don't need expensive gear to do macro photography, much less appreciate nature. We're lucky that in Singapore, there's always a park, PCN, or nature reserve not too far away. With that in mind, I would like to show you a very cheap and basic setup that you can use to take macro photography on your very own mobile phone. I carry these two around, around with me wherever I go because I can't bring my camera everywhere and you, might, and you never know what you might find on your way home from the MRT one day. In total, both of these probably cost me around $50. And over the next few slides, I will show you some of the photos that I've taken using just my phone. Hopefully, you'll find that anyone could actually start doing macro photography. First, I'll start off by showing some larger animals. On the left, you can see a colugo that I happened to come across in the zoo. It actually wasn't one of the captive animals. What happened was that it was sleeping high up in a tree when it suddenly fell down. It was stunned for a few seconds, allowing me to snap a few photos. The other photos that you can see here were taken at Sungai Bulo and a PCN near my house. Here are just a few photos I've taken of dragonflies and damselflies in the past. Dragonflies are one of the best subjects for beginners to photograph as they come to rest in a stationary position, allowing you to take photos of their big compound eyes. I personally really like how the dam mating damselflies on the right form a heart shape. Golden orb weavers are also another commonly seen but in fact misunderstood animal. They are one of the most gentle spiders to the extent that many people like to keep them as pets due to their mild dispositions. However, please don't take one from our nature reserves and keep it as a pet. This photo was actually taken at the zoo. A funny thing about macro photography is that ever since I started, Whenever I go to the zoo, I would stop looking at the animals in the exhibits and instead spend the time looking in the bushes for interesting insects. Sometimes, sometimes I'll even get funny looks from people who are probably wondering why I'm at the zoo but looking at some small, some small spider under a leaf. Over these next few slides, I would like to show how macro photography is really not all that hard to get into. You may think, how on earth am I going to find all these interesting creatures in all my time of being in Singapore? I've never even seen anything like this. Well, the simple truth is, it's probably because you have probably never seen them because you haven't been looking closely enough. All sorts of tiny interesting creatures are actually all around us. And in order to demonstrate this, all the photos in the next four slides were actually taken on the same night on my phone. On this slide, we can see a pale millipede, which crawls up into a ball with a black light, a black eyed little frog, and a huntsman spider with its young. Here you can see the striking colors of a young bush cricket. They're actually quite common, but wouldn't you be fascinated if you saw one? The photo on the right is of a jumping spider that was hanging around its home. Here, we can see an orb weaver having a feast, a caterpillar, and a very beautiful grass moth. If you look closely, you will see that there are actually parts of the moth's wings that are translucent and you can see the wing right through them. I'm particularly proud of these next photos. I actually used a special lighting method called backlighting. All that means is that I held the light below and behind the subject so that the edges of its hairs would shine and stand out in the darkness. Usually when people see caterpillars, their first reaction might be to think of them as ugly or gross, but hopefully you can now see them in a different light. 
So what are some practical tips that you can use to start doing microphotography in your own home? I came up with a short acronym here to help you remember some key points. Firstly, pay close attention. Keep your eyes peeled. You never know what you might find in the unlikeliest places. As Kevin shared previously, we actually found this beetle here in our own school, which is in the middle of one of the most busiest, which is one of the most busy commercial districts in Singapore. Secondly, hold your phone steady. Especially since macro subjects are so small, shaking becomes amplified and it might result in unwanted motion blur. You can try taking deep, slow breaths in order to regulate shaky movements. Next, observe the eyes. We macrophotographers always talk about getting the eyes in focus. That's because in photography, the eyes are always the most important part of your subject, since that's the first thing that people will look at. It's no different for insects, so don't worry if you can't get the entire creature in focus. You should also try to get close without disturbing the creature or putting yourself in harm's way. Macrophotography often requires that we get really up close and personal in order to get the most detailed image possible. The last tip is to overcome your fears. I personally remember having a phobia of butterflies, moths, and dragonflies when I was younger. We often see these creatures as unwelcome invaders in our homes. But when I went out into nature, I was able to see them in their own natural habitat, which allowed me to have a greater appreciation for them. So then, what are some places that you can go to find cool creatures? Many people only know of places like the Botanic Gardens and MacRitchie, but Singapore is actually home to lots of hidden gems. Here are some of them. I'll pause here for a short while if you would like to take a screenshot of this slide. Of course, it is important that we photographers follow a certain code of ethics. A good rule to follow is to leave nothing but footprints and take nothing but photographs. After all, what good is taking photos of wildlife if we don't respect them? So here are three things to keep in mind in order to help you to do so. Number one, respect the ecosystem. Number two, observe the opening and closing times. For most parks and nature reserves, this is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Number three, keep our nature reserves a safe haven for native biodiversity. Please keep a low volume and take your trash with you when you leave these green spaces. How important is it that we do so? Well, it may surprise you to know that even our minister, mentor Lee Kuan Yew himself, said that there is no hallmark of success more distinctive and more meaningful than achieving our position as the cleanest and greenest city in South Asia. To me, this really shows that just because you are pragmatic, it doesn't mean that you can't show care for our local nature. Taking good care of our local wildlife and their habitats is important in ensuring a bright future for Singapore, and nature is our ally for national development, not an obstacle. The best way that normal people like you and I can do this is by nurturing our curiosity for them. And macrophotography is a good way to do this. I hope that this talk has cleared some of your misconceptions and allowed you to see nature in a new light. Do give us a follow if you've enjoyed the photos that you've seen throughout the slides. Also, you can scan this QR code if you want to take a look at some online resources regarding our local biodiversity to get you kickstarted on a naturalist journey of your own. You can, also try, you can also find some really amazing nature photographers that are way better than us. Hopefully, they will inspire you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now we have some time for Q&A. And please don't hesitate to ask us any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Luke, Kevin, and Abjit for that uh, very inspiring talk. I think uh, our audience in Zoom and YouTube uh, would have gotten some tips on uh, how they can begin their journey and maybe even open their eyes a little bit more about what we have in Singapore since you, you showed us such great uh, photos and um, just seeing the biodiversity in a different light. We will take uh, a few questions as they have come in uh, now. So thanks to those who have submitted the questions. Uh, so maybe we will start with the first question. 
You had shared uh, some sites which are uh, good locations and uh, the ones that you would go to observe wildlife. Uh, but would you have some suggestions for uh, people who are just starting out? Uh, so what are some beginner friendly locations in Singapore uh, to observe wildlife? Uh, do, do you want to answer this? Oh yeah, sure. Um, definitely um, one, one place that comes to mind is uh, the Green Corridor, which is around Bukit Timah. This place is it's actually very close to nature and the and a lot of the plants here that you see are, are quite like wild because it's not like it's not like um it's not separated by like a railing or anything like that. So you can really get up close and personal, but at the same time, it's very easily accessible and you can find a lot of cyclists and joggers there. Um another place that I would think of is a dairy farm nature reserve. It's um it's quite a large reserve with with quite nice biodiversity that you can find, but it's also quite underrated because not a lot of people know about it. Um, another place that I can think of is uh, Tampanese Eco Green. Uh, Tampanese Eco Green is actually right in the middle of a, of a very built up area, but it's quite a large and expensive area where you can find some interesting biodiversity. I remember um, a few years ago, there was actually a population of rhino beetles in Tampanese Eco Green, which attracted a lot of photographers. I'm not sure if they're still around now, but that just kind of shows that, you know, even in such a built up area like, like Tampanese, um, there, are, there are like enclaves and then there are nature sanctuaries that you can find. Thanks a lot, Luke. I think uh, w what's amazing is that you also gave us uh, like one location and like different parts of Singapore. So for our audience, depending on where you live, you can literally go to the closest uh, park and then that would give you a good opportunity. Uh, I would also like to remind the, our audience about like two very important points our speakers made. Uh, one is how they would just go to the PCN right below their house and take those beautiful photos of the dragonflies and the damselflies. And um, there was also another point about uh, finding things just within their campus. So even when they're going to attend their classes, they have an opportunity to observe and learn more about wildlife. So I guess once you have the intention to stop, there is um, really a lot of places and it could really be right behind your house. We will take uh, the next question from the audience. So this could be interesting uh, for many of uh, us as well. When you first started out to do uh, the photography and got interested in wildlife, how did you learn to identify all the species? Because you're able to so um, eloquently talk about the different species names and their behavior. Uh, what resources did you use to gain this knowledge? Um, I, I guess I can talk about this. So I think um, you, even though you said that we talk very eloquently about it, in reality, we also do face a lot of issues when it comes to identifying species. Generally, for like larger creatures, like for example, birds or mammals, it, it's not particularly hard because the biodiverse because the diversity is it, not as diverse in that sense. There's not too many species, and so for those, for 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 example, for birds or mammals, you can use the uh, the site that we suggested, SG Biodiversity. And that list is pretty comprehensive. Um, another way is that whenever you see something interesting, you can just uh, shoot us a message and we'll get we'll reply to you as soon as possible and try to try to identify the creatures. But I think the biggest problem comes um, when we are when we are looking at, I guess, uh, the, the the smaller insects because it, there are so many different morphs of insects, and because of that a lot of them are like undescribed or you might see something that's different but kind of similar to something else and you're not sure if it's the same. Um, my advice for that is to, firstly, you, you kind of have to get like, you, you have to get uh, knowledge of like the, the larger like and, and more like uh, comprehensive groups, for example, like uh, under like orb weaver spiders, there are so many different types but just generally knowing the, 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 the big and the, the, the bigger label is, is good enough already. 
And once again, you can use SG Biodiversity. However, you might face some troubles in trying to identify uh, very specific creatures, uh, very specific insects that you actually see. Yeah. Okay, thanks for uh, those tips and then uh, sharing your your journey as well, like how it didn't start off so easy, but then like uh, just being persistent and patient with this um, helps you with, um, uh, with learning more about these creatures. So there is uh, an interesting question, question that just came in. Uh, since you had spoken so extensively about uh, insects, um, we have an audience member asking us, what would you recommend to people who have phobias of insects? Like, did you come across maybe even your peers or um, your family members, your classmates who, uh, who just had an inherent fear towards these insects? And uh, for those people, what would be your tips and recommendations? Um, okay, I guess I'll take this question. So when I was younger, um, I, I mentioned, I did mention just now that when I was younger, I actually had quite a bad phobia of uh, moths, butterflies, dragonflies, and those, kind of, those kinds of flying insects, because I didn't like the way that they would, they would like flutter towards me. And I didn't like the kind of erratic movement that they had. And whenever I, I saw like, especially a big one in, um, in my house, I will get quite scared and I'll try and avoid it. And I remember back in like 2015, there was a there was a large migratory population of moths that came to Singapore and they were really big and that really terrified me. But I think for me, I guess the turning point was when I went trekking with Kevin one time. And I remember we were we were, you know, we were walking through, you know, this this like dense, you know, vegetation, and we came across this stream. And in this stream, there were like tons of dragonflies just flying around. And for some reason, I didn't really feel as scared because, you know, whenever you see a dragonfly in your house, it's always, it's always, um, it's always like, you know, flying and like hitting itself against the wall and creating this really like unpleasant rattling sound. But, you know, in the, in nature, they seem really peaceful, you know, just flying around, hovering above the water perching on like leaves and stuff like that and for some reason when I was there even though there were like probably 20 or so dragonflies I didn't really I didn't really feel scared I felt like I felt you know um accepting of the fact that they were there and that because I was able to see them in their natural habitat and I realized that oh you know these things are not they're not foreign in fact they're the opposite of foreign because they're like the most natural things that there are so Practically, how does that really help with a phobia? I'm not sure. You, your phobia may not go away if you go into the forest one day. But I think that it does. That a lot of phobia arises from misunderstanding. And the more you build up your understanding about these things, the more you'll be able to understand that actually they have no intention to harm you. So even though you may have a bit of an instinctive you know, repulsion, over time, as you increase your exposure to these things, you get more and more used to it to the point where you may not have a phobia anymore, or it might be very slight. Thanks, Luke, for uh, sharing that very personal experience. I think that makes uh, a big difference uh, in overcoming some of these fears. And um, I, I think the audience, or even some of our younger audience who are just beginning to um, look at wildlife around them would benefit from this. Uh, we will take one last question. Uh, actually, there were more that came in, but uh, due to time constraint, I think we have to uh, go with this uh, question. So this is uh, something a little bit more broad. So if uh, you had to share like um, a key learning point from this uh, journey to appreciate Singapore's biodiversity, what would it be? Um, again, as I mentioned, this would help inspire uh, our younger audience or the beginners who are looking into starting um, learning more about our biodiversity. Okay, uh, yeah, I think, I think I'll be able to take this question. So, okay, I, 
I'd like to mention, first of all, that um, I started maybe a year later than Kevin and Luke. And I feel like this question is actually quite relevant for me because, um, you know, I, I, I actually very, I, I noticed a very obvious change in my behavior towards uh, insects because uh, I really started to love them. Okay, but I'll, I'll be a bit more specific, right? So what was the uh, transition and what was, the pro what was my progress as I started to interact with more and more with insects? Well, building on Luke's point, he said that when we get to see insects in their natural form, in nature, you know, you, you really, your, your perception about them really changes. I feel like a lot of the times when people are scared, when people are scared of insects or they have phobias of insects is because, you know, we usually interact only with the insects that might like fly into our homes. Those ones, like they're, they're obviously like super frantic, you know, they, uh, but, but then when you go into nature, when you see, when you see like, like how he said, when you see dragonflies just like calmly hovering around the water, you, you really notice that. They, they have no intention of harming you. I, I feel like on top of that, another key aspect, another, another key change in my behavior was that I started to respect them. I started to respect insects. Because the, the thing is, one of the things I realized was that insects are a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. For example, jumping spiders, I mean, a lot of jumping spiders, if you, if, you, if you look at their behavior itself, they're, they're incredibly inquisitive. They look around, they, they're not scared of climbing onto things, they explore. Of course, along with uh, their interesting behavior, it also tells us that they're thinking, that it's, I mean, an insect is not a mindless creature that wants to bite you, it's going after your blood. That's, that's definitely not the case. When we, see the, when we see the behavior of insects, we, we see that they think, they can think, they can really interact with their environment. And I feel like this is a very profound observation and it's a very important learning. It's a really, it, it, it was really important for me when I started to realize that, that, when I started to respect insects. When I started to respect them, I said, okay, this obviously means that they deserve more appreciation. And this is how I decided, this is how I became an advocate for their appreciation and for the appreciation of Singapore's biodiversity. Yeah, so, so to recap, I would just like to say that um, the main learning, uh, the main, the key learning is to appreciate that insects are intelligent. And when you appreciate that insects are intelligent, you start to respect them. And when you respect them, you will start to, you know, you, you will want to spread this knowledge to everyone else. Yeah. Thank you so much, Archiv. And um, uh, I would also like to thank all our speakers who very patiently uh, took the audience questions. And um, the answers are truly inspiring. As uh, Singapore evolves to become a city in nature, it is important for us to understand and respect um, nature around us. And uh, thank you for uh, giving your uh, thoughts on that matter as well. Oh, John, Shui, can I just add one thing? Sure. Um, if, if any of you have any questions that, uh, weren't, that we didn't have the time to answer, then you can always contact us. Um, we can, you can always contact us uh, later on. You can just shoot us a message on Instagram or whatever. I'm not sure if you if you're able to scan the QR code, but all the all the links and resources are there. So, yeah. Thanks a lot, Luke, for for even offering to take uh, questions after this session. Uh, to our audience members, if uh, you had enjoyed today's session and then it. Um, it piqued your interest. We have more such talks about Singapore's biodiversity in our NPARC's YouTube channel. So do uh, go into that to have a look. We do have more talks lined up over this weekend, as I mentioned in a celebration of Festival of Biodiversity. We have one that's happening later today. So if you would like to join in, if you're free, uh, please stream in to YouTube or register uh, for the sessions. 
We also have two more sessions tomorrow in the morning uh, from an educator who will be talking about engaging students uh, with special needs on biodiversity programs and an afternoon session on making Singapore climate resilient. Uh, so do join in and the registration links will be sent to you via the chat box. And do not forget that this weekend we are also having Festival of Biodiversity. So there are a lot of on-site and online activities for all of you to take part in and enjoy and appreciate Singapore's natural heritage. So do visit the website or if you're in the area of Botanic Gardens, try to drop by and see the various exhibits that are uh, displayed Thank you so much for attending today's talk. So if you enjoyed it, if you have any feedback for us, please scan the QR code and let us know what you felt about the session today. Uh, take care, everyone. Stay safe. And then we will definitely see you in another beautiful session like this in the coming days. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>